It says, for you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. Amen? So, <clears throat> my sermon title again is Our Time of Trouble. I believe we're coming upon it very quickly now. How many believe that? Okay. So as I begin this morning, let me open with prayer. Loving Father, we ask that you would be with us this morning and that you would bless our time together, that we might draw close to you and be ready for your soon appearing. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. How many complain? Okay. Complaints to God about the problems we are facing just shows a lack of faith that he's in control. How many believe God's in control, no matter what happens? Okay? But sometimes we doubt it. Really? You're allowing this? Re remember, God is in control. You might not like what's happening, but he's still in control. And he's allowing things to happen in your life so that you'll realize that he is in control. You know? It's similar to when the Israelites were in Egypt and they thought God was not in control. But they had to learn a few lessons before uh, they could come out. We need to ask for the Holy Spirit to help us to deal with whatever. Are you hearing this morning? You know, we want to be delivered by his outstretched hand, but we have to have the faith that he's going to do it the way he wants. And we have to go along with whatever that happens to be. I'd like you to look at Exodus 6, verses 10 through 13. It's up on the screen. And it says... And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the children of Israel go out of his hand, land. And Moses spoke before the Lord, saying, The children of Israel have not, catch this, not heeded, not listened to me. How then shall, this, shall Pharaoh heed me, for I am of uncircumcised lips? And then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a command for the children of Israel, for Pharaoh of the king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. I fear too much of the time. Most of us don't have the faith that God's going to bring us through whatever. But he always does. Is that right? I can have both hands up, I'll tell you. He brings us through whatever it happens to be. We just need to trust him. Okay? And here it plainly says that the Israelites weren't listening and neither was Pharaoh. Pharaoh had to go through ten trials before he got the word. And some of us, you know, this cabeza, this head is thick too. We don't get it the first time. Am I the only one? <laughs> All right. Just check it. Moses had complained to God about the difficulties he was facing and the burdens the Israelites were facing. Chapter 6 again, verses 1 through 9, says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. I want you to catch this. God is saying, watch what I'm going to do. And in each of our lives, you know, we need to watch and see what God does. When there seems like there's no way, no open doors anywhere, but God will provide at the right time what you need. Did you catch what I said? At the right time. Not the time that you want I want you to catch this, not the time you want, but at the right time. When things are all lined up, then it will provide.
but we're always anxious. And many times, we want to run in front. <laughs> Am I the only one here? <laughs> okay. Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will let them go, and with a strong hand, he will drive them out of this land. But you remember the story. It took 10 trials before he let them go. Sometimes we're not waiting for the 10th trial to come along before we're ready. Okay? We're always wanting to jump ahead. I can do it. You know, we're like a two-year-old. I do it. I do it. Are you hearing me? And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Jehovah or Lord, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to bring, give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. And I have also groaned, uh, heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians kept keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you. Catch this. I take you out of the bondage and redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel. And now what does it say? Some of us are like that. <laughs> but they did not heed Moses because of what? The circumstances. I want you to catch this. It's the circumstances. They're not listening because of the circumstances. Are we in the same boat? I can't see my way. Nothing's happening. Moses is at his wit's end to know what to do. But God gives him the assurance of success when he says in verse 6, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. We need to hang on to the promises. Amen? Too much of the time we're hanging on to what our eyes see, what our ears hear, and not hanging on to the promises that he gives us. Pharaoh was an arrogant and proud man. And God waited until the situation was unbearable for the Israelites because they weren't ready for deliverance. And I read this from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 260. It says, The Hebrews had expected to obtain their freedom without any special trial of their faith or any real suffering or hardship. Are you catching these words? They want to go through it with no pain. Is that possible? <laughs> How many can testify that's not possible, right? But they were not yet prepared for deliverance. They had little faith in God and were unwillingly, patiently to endure their affliction until he could see fit to work for them. I want you to catch that. They had little faith. So God's got to develop the faith. And unwillingly, you know, unwilling to patiently wait for deliverance. 
You know, we are the microwave generation. True? Come on, folks. Talk to me this morning. We like it now. Many were content, catch this, many were content to remain in bondage rather than meet the difficulties attending removal to a strange land. And the habits of some had become so much like the Egyptians that they preferred to dwell in Egypt. Therefore, the Lord did not deliver them by the first manifestation of his power before Pharaoh. How many times? Ten times, right? So he didn't do it the first time, or the second, or the third, or the fifth, or the sixth, or the seventh, or the eighth, or the ninth, but after the tenth. He overruled events more fully to develop the tyrannical spirit of the Egyptian king and also reveal to himself, reveal himself to his people. So he was doing it in a way so that they could understand. He had to reveal how the king really was. Sometimes we need to see how sin really is before we're willing to give it up. And reveal himself to his people. Beholding his justice, his power, and his love, that they would catch the word, choose, choose to leave Egypt and give themselves to his service. The task of Moses would have been much less difficult had not many of the Israelites become so corrupted that they were unwilling to catch this to leave Egypt. Too many of us have become so accustomed to this place, we don't want to go to heaven. And God says, you have to be dissatisfied here so you'll want to be with him there. You know, God allows the wickedness to, to advance for a while. so that we really realize their true spirit. You know, right now, the LGBTQ agenda is stronger and stronger than ever. That our religious liberty is gradually being stripped away. That the advocates of abortion have gone far beyond what most of us have ever dreamed that now that they're willing to abort even at the point of birth. And it's even worse because some ministers and Christians condone such things and many more by their silence have done nothing. We must realize that things will get exceedingly worse even in the leadership within the church and churches who go along with the government before Jesus comes. The world will never reform. This is not our home. We're just traveling through. We're journeying through this place. It will never reform because it's under Rome's control and Satan's control. God sent Moses to Pharaoh several times to allow his people to go. God's authority is not something to be played with or questioned. We're simply to obey without murmuring or disputing. But God, you could do it this way. Yeah, you could, but he's going to do it his way, whatever that may be. Today, people are even... God's people are even, have the problem with authority. I didn't hear a name. I heard one. From volume four of the testimonies, it says 162, many who, like ancient Israel, possess, profess to keep God's commandments, have hearts of unbelief, 
while outwardly observing the statutes of God. I hope you catch this. Outwardly, they look like good Christians. But inwardly, they're not really following. The Bible says in Hebrews, without faith, it's impossible to what? Please him. And he won't deliver us either. We know that Pharaoh didn't listen until he lost his own son, the 10th trial. And I believe the rulers of this world will be the same with us. And let me remind you, who is gliding this global system? Rome, and who's behind that? Satan himself, okay? You notice Rome's leadership with a global climate change agenda. Especially notice that about two years ago, the Pope called all the leaders of the world, but not just governments, but he called media people, big business that would go along with his agenda. Communication people. And the ongoing communication with these people Restricting ask, access for God's people, in particular, in the future. So that God's people and his message can be eventually severely restricted. Great Controversy, page 564 and 5, says, and I want you to catch this. Because a lot of people don't understand this. They've never read the Great Controversy. The Constitution of the United States guarantees liberty of conscience. Nothing is dear or more fundamental. Pope Pius IX, in his incendial letter of August 15, 1854, said, the absurd and erroneous doctrines or ravings of defense of liberty of conscience are a most pestilent error, a pest of all others most to be dreaded in a state. I want you to understand what, they're under, what they feel for us. Liberty of conscience should not be anything on the scene. It says it's the most terrible thing. Understand if the Constitution is changed, that's what this uh, convention of states is all about, to change our constitution. Because once it's changed, everything will change. And guess who will be in power? He says it's the most terrible thing, okay? The same pope, 10 years later, in his encyclical letter of December 8th, 1864, anathematize those who assert that liberty of conscience and religious worship also, all such as maintaining that the church may not employ force, but they're going to. Understand Rome hates religious liberty and hates religious worship that's not their way. It goes on to say, the pacific tone of Rome in the United States does not imply a change of heart. Rome, or she, is tolerant where she is helpless, says Bishop O'Connor. Religious liberty is merely endured until the opposite can be carried into effect without peril to the Catholic Church. I hope you're listening. The Archbishop of St. Louis once said, heresy and unbelief are crimes. And in Christian countries like Italy and Spain, for instance, where all the people are Catholics and where the Catholic religion is an essential part of the law of the land, they are punished as other crimes. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The Globus are pushing their agenda. And the will, 
and will bring oppression and misery to the people of the world. But first, the U.S. has to be brought to its needs and fall. So all other nations will follow. The policies now being implemented are global policies and are designed to increase the wealth, are not designed to increase the wealth of the poor. It is designed to bring the nation to its knees so that Rome can move in and take power. Matthew 26, 11 says, For the, you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. So why do they want to bring economic freedom to an end? Why? Listen to this. If you take away economic freedom, you can take away other freedoms. America has always been a bulwark of freedom, economic, personal, and religious. Therefore, America must be stripped of her freedom, especially religious freedom. Religious freedom is the ultimate target. As we saw with the closing of the churches during the pandemic, but not Walmart or Albertsons. Or where? Okay. I'm afraid that most are not getting ready and helping others to be ready for the coming trial. Volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 463, says, The work which the church has failed to do in time of peace and prosperity, she will have to do in the terrible crisis under most discouraging and forbidding circumstances. The warnings that, the worldly, conf that worldly conformity has silenced or with withheld must be given under the fiercest opposition from enemies of the faith. If we don't do it now, while well, it's easy. It's, we're going to have to do it during the most forbidding times. That's why I appreciate what Debbie's trying to do and outreach committee and what have, because we need to be telling others now while it's easier. The members of the church will individually be tested and proved. They will be placed in circumstances where they will be forced to bear witness for the truth. Did you catch that? Many will be called to speak before councils and courts of justice, perhaps separately and alone. Just as God allowed the magicians to turn rods or staffs into snakes, the appearance of snakes, so at the end of time the deceptions will be great. We cannot believe our eyes. We will not be able to believe our ears, but we'll be able to believe only in God's word. Because the deceptions that the devil will bring will be just beyond belief. And it will be impossible to tell the difference unless you know his word. You know, God allows the lying spirit to do strange things to expose the superficial faith that some have. To test the faith of others and to confirm the fidelity or infidelity of many. So he can sort the wheat from the tares. Revelation 22.11 says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Throughout history, Satan has used deception to get the better of us. Truth versus error. Jesus versus Satan. You can't believe the media or the news anymore because you don't know who's telling the truth and who's telling the false. I can only trust here. 
because much of what we see and hear is fake. You can't believe the government because they have hidden, a hidden agenda. Satan is getting the world conditioned not to know the truth when they hear it. And the only thing I can rely upon is the unchanging word of God. He said it, I believe it. But most people don't even study their Bibles. Don't even know what it says. So how will they be ready to survive the coming onslaught? Can I trust my senses? That's what got Eve in trouble. Okay? And it hasn't stopped. And so those who stand for the truth will survive. And those who don't, won't. Simple as that. And I want you to be on the side of truth with Jesus. Amen? How many want to be with Jesus when he comes? Then you have to take the time and the effort every day to know what he says. Because I believe he's coming soon, sooner than most think. And the Lord needs to help us to be faithful to him and to help as many others into the kingdom as possible. Amen? Because we know the truth. We have all that he's given us. And he's given us so much. We need to be the salt of the earth. Amen? Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Loving Father, we thank you for your many blessings. Most of all, for Jesus and his word that gives us comfort, promises to depend on, and for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which gives us words to speak to others and help along the way. So bless us, we ask, this Sabbath day. And may we be faithful to you till you come. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.